Good evening. Welcome to my lecture recital. Today I'm going to speak about Beethoven's Sonata, Opus 111, the last of his 32 published sonata. According to Charles Rosen, together with Opus 109 and Opus 110, Opus 111 represents a farewell to sonata form. They were composed from 1820 to 1822. Slightly earlier than his Ninth Symphony, and these works all belong to his late period. During these years, Beethoven almost completely lost his hearing, so he was experiencing more isolation than before. Also, during this time, Beethoven started to search out new harmonies and musical structures and many commentators express the opinion that he achieved a deeper spirituality in his work. Today, I will mainly focus on the struggle part we can hear in the Opus 111, and where this struggle comes from in his life. In 1802, Beethoven wrote a letter to his brothers, which we call the Heiligenstadt Testament, named for where he was staying at the time. It coincides with the beginning of what we call Beethoven's middle period, sometimes also called the heroic period. The Heiligenstadt Testament is an unsent letter in which he expressed desperate feeling about his increasing loss of hearing. His deafness began in 1798, when he was 28 years old. And by 1801, he had lost 60% of his hearing. During these years, we can imagine Beethoven struggling with himself every day. Should he end his life or not? he might already have thought about how to end his life. He was living under huge pressure as a musician, facing complete deafness. It is almost impossible to imagine what he was experiencing. So the struggle and combat against fate was the main feature for the rest of Beethoven's life. One of the ways the struggle can be seen in Opus 111 is through the tonality. He was struggling with parallel keys, C minor and C major. The difference between the tonic chord is that the C minor has an E flat and C major has E natural. First of all, C minor and E flat major are two important keys in Beethoven's life. In my understanding, C minor represents Beethoven's tragic and self-pitying side. For example, his pathetic sonata, Symphony No. 5, and the third piano concerto are all in C minor. And these works were composed around the beginning of his middle period. E flat major represents the heroic side of Beethoven. For example, his Symphony No. 3, Eroica, and a Concerto No. 5, Emperor, are all in this key. E flat major could represent hope and desire in Beethoven's life, and the encouragement to combat unfair fate and reality. In the second movement of Opus 111, he chose C major, in which E natural play a crucial part of the harmony. This might be his reconciliation with reality and fate. Another important representation of struggle in this piece is a trio. In the Baroque period, the original purpose of the trio was extending and repetition of an appoggiatura which always started from the upper note and resolved to the lower note. 
Another function developed later with tools that simply extend、uh, the length of the note, which is especially important for long notes on the keyboard. It could be expressive, but most often it was not meaningful, in the sense that the trill had a function beyond a sort of harmonic or melodic suspension. However, Beethoven purposefully makes use of trills to express certain meanings. They are not merely the extension of a single note anymore. In Opus 111, Beethoven was,、uh, uses many trills, especially in the second movement. For example, between Variation Four and Variation Five, we see a trill section from measure、uh, from 12 measures. So please look at the screen.、Uh, so that's、uh, in during the measure 106, it, the trill goes 12 measures, and.、Uh, It is not easy to play the triple trio part. It starts from measure 122 to one, measure 1,、uh, 112 to 113. Yes,、uh, and、uh, I don't think Beethoven just want to make pianist life harder. So it goes like this. And uh, uh, from the next measure, the A flat goes up by half steps. So this half steps、um, trio, for me, it、um, they are not difficult. Uh, compared to the triple trio to play, but emotionally it feels harder for me.、Uh, I always feel I need to spend more energy when I play these half step、uh, trios. Therefore, the trio increases the tension of the piece, and it definitely means something in Beethoven's music. This sonata only has two movements. Actually, we can see that he planned. Three movements in his sketchbook from 1821, but with the finishing of the second movement, he started to abandon the three-movement idea. His biographer Anton Schindler asked him why there are only two movements in this sonata. He answered, "I didn't have the time to write a third movement." This might be Beethoven's humor. But it also lends weight to Charles Rosen's idea of a farewell to traditional sonata form. Before I go through the detail in Opus 111, let's look at some similarities between Opus 111 and other sonatas. First of all, I will show the similarities between the Pathetic Sonata and Opus 111. The Pathetic Sonata was composed in 1798. So both sonatas are in C minor. C minor is a very special key for Beethoven. I will read the quote from Charles Rosen. So Beethoven in C minor has come to symbolize his artistic character. In every case, it reveals Beethoven as a hero. C minor does not show Beethoven at his most subtle, but it does give him to us in his most actual form, where he seems to be most impatient of any compromise. That's the first similarity, and the second one: both sonatas have a slow introduction at the beginning of the first movement, and followed by a fast allegro cambrio. And in the introduction, both sonatas use dotted rhythm figures, suggestive of French overture style and a certain nobility or grand purpose. So, if you can see the two introduction part on the screen, so they both use the dotted rhythm, very clear. And、uh, 
The next similarity: both sonatas go back to the introductory ideas before a concluding coda section. In the Pathetic Sonata, it goes back to the slow introduction part briefly for four measures. So those three lines. The second one is a, a idea of introductory part, and then it uh, soon goes to the coda. And in Opus One Eleven on the right side, although it doesn't quote the introduction as obviously, in measure one forty six. So as you can see, the fortissimo go, starts there.、Uh, it does recall three diminished chords when、uh, which opens a piece. Also in the four measures, which immediately precedes a coda. And、uh, we can see that Beethoven was influenced by Mozart as well. For example, in the first movement. From measure 132 to 136,、uh, 133, we find two descending broken diminished chords. So it sounds like this. So that's the Beethoven Opus 111. So it's on the left side of the、uh, screen. So it's the first one is on.、Uh, Diminished seventh chord and the se second diminished chord. And according to Charles Rosen, Beethoven was inspired by Mozart's Sonata A Minor, K310, from measure 126 to 127. It's on the right side of the screen. We can see the example here. So,、um, so the first one is on G sharp diminished chord. Diminished chord goes to the left hand. Those two diminished chord. Now I'm going to talk about、uh, certain details, specifically in Opus 111. So the first movement is in sonata form, and Beethoven also makes use of fugal style. Within the sonata form in his first movement, in the late period, he went back to study the old Baroque period music, and in his late works, we can see influences of Bach, Handel, and Palestrina. Beethoven's music becomes more contrapuntal and polyphonic, although using fugato in the development section was not a new thing. Only Mozart combined the sonata form with fugal texture together in his string quartet finale, K387. And in Beethoven's five late period sonatas, four of them used a fugue or fugato in some movement or another. However, this was the first time he combined sonata form with a fugue texture. In the first movement, the sonata starts with a slow introduction marked maestoso. Beethoven used、uh, three diminished chords, which are built first on F sharp. Interestingly, and maybe even intentionally. These three diminished seventh chords make use of all twelve tones in an octave. These three diminished chords appear in the same order throughout the whole first movement, whenever they are used. The diminished seventh chord has extremely unstable quality. The first of,、uh, note of this sonata is E flat. At measure four, please look at the screen.、Uh, the B diminished chord resolves to C major. Uh, as I mentioned, the struggle.
struggle is between E flat and E natural. So I feel Beethoven just throw us into the dilemma and tension immediately. The exposition starts from measure 19 with an ascending figure of four notes, which sounds very angry and radical in the first C minor movement. So it sounds like this. So that's a four note. And it also comes back in the second movement, and I will talk about that later. Both hands play in unison in one octave apart without any other counterpoint for 10 measures. A clear texture that is used to introduce the primary motives of the sonata and the subject of the fugue. So it sounds like this. So that's for 10 measures without any counter subject. Please look at the, uh, this on the screen. So the second uh, example, this is a, uh, oh, actually it's the first one. This is a motive or a subject of this first movement. The subject can be divided into two parts, one ascending, one descending. So it sounds like this. that the descending motives are really the inversion uh, of the ascending motive that begins the exposition. From measure 35, Beethoven develops the subject by greatly lengthening the descending portion of the original material using running 16th notes to initiate a sequential transition to the second key area. We still can hear the original shape of the subject. So, uh, so from there, so we still can hear. So that's the original subject. Uh, so he um, further as a counter subject in an eighth note figure. So here you can see in the left hand from measure 36. So it, that is the counter subject. Um, derived from the ascending portion of the main subject actually. So, so that's that part. The second thing starts from measure 50. The second theme is in A flat major, which is a subdominant of C minor. He first uses a medium key relationship as a second theme in his Opus 31, number one, also in Waldstein Sonata, Opus 53. The second theme appears in the medium of the tonic. So this sonata, the second theme, contrasts with the first theme not angry anymore, it becomes in, uh, introspective and calm, using the dotted rhythms of the introduction to achieve a kind of tender nobility. So the second theme sounds like this. second thing. The development section employs a very short double fugue-like texture using two subjects. The first subject is the three quarter notes of the main theme and the second subject is also from the main theme as shown in this example. So the, in the top left side is the first subject and uh, then the right side is the uh, second subject. Although they don't have exactly same intervals, 
but we can see that the shape and idea of each are very similar. We understand the second subject is a sort of augmentation of the first subject. Beethoven took those four notes uh, from the main theme and transformed it into second subject or counter subject in the development section, making use of diminished seventh interval, so in harmonic play spelled as slightly altering the intervallic content of the opening two notes gesture. And uh, please also look at the screen, the uh, next example. I marked the first subject in yellow and the second subject in red. The material in blue which is very vague. You can see it's a four uh, descending notes. Uh, so those four notes, it's a continuation of the second subject or counter subject, which we can understand as a diminution and inversion of the last half of the first subject. So the uh, four descending notes, the blue, from measure 78, so it goes like that. So also this four descending notes, and then the last measure, measure 80, so also in the middle voice. So uh, it is a, a little tail can be placed at the end of the second subject. We can't really call this short section a proper field because it has no episodes. Instead, Beethoven takes the opportunity to mix formal styles as he develops both motivic units and harmonic motion. From measure 86 to measure 89, we find a transition in which Beethoven uses three diminished chords to link development and recapitulation. The chords recall the first three diminished chords which open the introduction. Uh, I marked those three diminished chords on the score and it all goes by the same order from the uh, beginning. Further blurring the formal lines, of three parts that are, are typical in sonata form. Although he had employed this idea before in pieces such as the Appassionata Sonata, first movement, in which the recapitulation returns with the original key and the material over a dominant pedal point. The second theme in the recapitulation is in C major, which is foreshadowing the C major of the second movement. Beethoven also finishes the first movement with a Piccadilly third, also carrying us into the C major of the second movement, Ariata. But C major chords of the first movement are framed by a passing reference to F minor so that we briefly experiencing them as a dominant of F minor. Beethoven first does this in another C minor sonata at the end of Opus 10, number one, the last movement. So please look at the screen. The right side is the Opus 10, number one. Uh, so the from starting from measure 114, so it goes third of C major also here. So it demonstrates very clear 
uh, that Beethoven has to do the similar things in uh, so in the same keys sonatas the works. So the second movement is an ariata and five variations plus one incomplete variation or coda. The reason why I call it coda because. Uh, the ariata and the first five variations all have two sections. The first section is in C major, and the, the second section is in A minor. However, the last coda only has a first C major section. The second movement has a strong contrast with the first movement. The first movement is about struggle, anger, and harmonic tension. And the second movement is about peace, consolation, and consonance. This movement, for me, reveals human nature, the, the distance between reality and desire, the distance between earth and heaven. It is a deeply spiritual and sublime movement. The arata is derived from a waltz by Diabelli. He sent this waltz to many European composers and uh, asked them uh, to write variations on this thing. The beginning of the, the waltz sounds like this. It also shows on the screen. eventually wrote the Diabelli variation by using this theme. In Opus 111, Beethoven took the opening two gestures and made this theme more solemn. So we can hear... Ariata, and I will read the quote from Charles Rosen. It's on the screen. Beethoven knew how to strip naked the simplest elements of tonality in order to release their full power, to use the commonplace to review what made it so irresistible. Diabelli is complacent. He does no more than use the commonplace. He does not like Beethoven, insists upon it obsessively until it releases its full potential. Beethoven's crudeness was provocative, never fortuitous or thoughtless, and it could be juxtaposed to and even combined with a sophistication of extreme refinement and delicacy. His art was never innocent, but it often deliberately skirts the edge of the description of the they are artless. The ariata is in 916 and starts from the weak beat. It is in two sections, as I mentioned, and in a symmetrical structure. Both sections have eight measures. I grouped the first three variations together because they share the, uh, the similarities. Uh, first, they all have eight plus eight symmetrical structure. Second, every variation increases the speed of smallest note value from the previous one. The first variation has a 16th note triplet figure. First variation and the second variation is in 616 and uh, it adds a 32nd note value. So, uh, and then the tempo marking of the third variation is 1232nd, uh, adding a 64th note value. The third variation is also the climax of the first three variations. So it sounds like this. So each variation feels faster than the previous one. 
the meter force variation comes back to 916. Each half of this variation can be divided into two sections. The first in a, is in a lower register. Please take a look at the screen. So. That's the first section. And at the measure 72, so you can see the last line, it goes to the higher register of piano. The right hand has 32nd note figures, and left hand has a steady 16th note figure. So the lower register and the higher register are the communication or contrast between earth and heaven. The two sections of each half function as written out repeats, corresponding to the repeat sign in the theme and further three variations, which means that we need to always be taking the repeats in the movement for formal balance. For me, the left hand in this variation is objective. So it's... So even in the higher register, so it never changed. So something, I think the left hand we, is something we cannot resist very objective, like time, restriction, or reality. The right hand is subjective. It might be our subconscious, our feelings, thoughts. And this makes the second movement become very philosophical for me. Between the fourth and fifth variation, we find a link section from measure 96 to me uh, measure 130. And uh, in measure 102, so the right side of the uh, screen, please uh, look at that. And uh, the four notes ascending figure in the first movement comes back. Four uh, note figure. Uh, so this time, it doesn't sound angry anymore, but it feels more assured and uh, triumphant in the C major movement. In this link section, it is the first time that his, uh, the second movement goes to E flat major. So uh, the left side of the uh, screen shows from measure 110. The B flat dominant seventh chord stays for four measures, and actually start from the beginning of the, this this page. So measure one o six starts on the note D. And the left hand has the descending figure from the, uh, the errata. Actually, the first measure. And uh, uh, from measure 114 to uh, 140, uh, 116, the right hand A flat goes up by half steps. Uh, so and then this C goes up to D. This D finally becomes to the leading tone of E flat major. and in measure 118. The right hand of measure 118 and one, uh, 119 is a figure of Ariata from measure 6 to measure 8. So, it's, uh, so it sounds like this. So in the Ariata, it sounds like this. So in these two measures, both hands finally reach the highest and lowest uh, point of this section, F, and C flat. Almost the 
edge of Beethoven's uh, keyboard, and which also shows the biggest distance in the world. As I mentioned before, this sonata is about struggle between C minor and C major, E flat, uh, e flat and E natural. So this C major movement, the E flat major section might be a combat against the unfair fate of Beethoven. So it's something like a desire for him. It followed by transitional sequence and the tonality is not stable in this section. So So the post can actually if you see on the screen uh Okay, so yes, on the left uh, the right side of the screen, yes. So actually I didn't put the first part of this transition section, the unstable section. So the left hand and the right hand actually is the communication. So be, uh, or actually uh, something like a introspection for Beethoven himself. Uh, both hands alternate the melody. Uh, so in measure 129, it arrives in A flat major, finally. So in, that's the second measure of, on the spring. And uh, transitioning back to dominant of C major uh, by means of an F sharp diminished seventh chord. first movement. So uh, please look at the left side of the spring. So in measure 12, so the left hand is the F. is in three voices and it combines the slowest and the fastest motion from the previous variation. Uh, so the slow A note is on the top voice and the 16th note figure in the middle voice and the 32nd note figure in the lower voice. This variation uh, is about gratitude, joy, and forgiveness for Beethoven after all struggling and tension. It feels relieved in this fifth variation. The last incomplete variation, what I call the coda, is the conclusion of the whole piece. The right hand, if you can see on the screen, uh, is the trio combined with the uh, melody in the higher register. And then the left hand ha also has the treble figure. Or, and uh, in measures 174, it comes down to the lower register, which I think it is the first part. So thank you for listening to my presentation. I will play this piece after a short pause.